Okay. Right, you had some homework last week, ploughing through G.D. Cummins' sermon, Primitive Episcopacy. And it really is a period piece, um, to the point where I think I need to spend about 15 or 20 minutes giving some background to this particular sermon. In a very real sense, it's exactly that. It's a period piece reflecting the conflict between high churchmen and evangelicals over the doctrine of apostolic succession in the mid-19th century. I think it would be fair to say that both sides were inclined to take extreme positions, and Cummins' sermon reflects the low view of episcopacy that was common amongst evangelicals at the time. The immediate background to this sermon does need a little explanation. The Annus Mirabilis for both the High Churchmen and the Evangelicals in the Protestant Episcopal Church can fairly be said to have been 1811. In that year, John Henry Hobart was consecrated as the Assistant Bishop of New York, and he soon became the most active representative of the old High Church school in the Episcopal Church. On the other side of the ledger, Alexander Vietz Griswold uh, was consecrated as the Bishop of the Eastern Diocese which was a ragtag and bobtail diocese made up of all the New England states except Connecticut, uh, where there were enough Episcopalians to maintain their own bishop. Uh, and what made Griswold unusual was that he was the first um, acknowledged evangelical to become a bishop in the Episcopal Church. He was also one with a high church background. So what you have in 1811, is the two major parties for three quarters of the 19th century first get their, uh, a, a real representative bishop of their position. Griswold remained in the Eastern Diocese for 32 years and he was responsible for setting the churchmanship of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, uh, New Hampshire, which originally set off as relatively evangelical dioceses. Both men were active and popular bishops. Both men's dioceses experienced considerable growth. Shortly after, after the death of Hobart in 1830, the Diocese of New York, which had become the largest in the Episcopal Church in terms of numbers, had to be split. And this threw up the problem uh, for the first time in the Episcopal Church. What you do if you've got more than one diocese in a state. Apart from the withdrawal of Vermont in 1836, the Eastern Diocese remained intact until Griswold's death in 1843, when it divided into a number of smaller dioceses corresponding to the then existing state boundaries. By the time of Griswold's death in 1843, the strife between high and low was really getting going. The Carey case, the tactless administrations of the two Ondonk brothers in the Diocese of New York and Pennsylvania, the fuss created by Tract 90, had all served to worsen the atmosphere between high and low churchmen. The history of the church in the 1840s and the 1850s is defiled by a series of slightly frivolous disciplinary actions against high church bishops for moral offences. But for the most part, these um, prosecutions were not really disciplinary actions, but the covers for some really nasty sectional politics. Unlike other denominations, the Episcopal Church did not have much in the way of strife over slavery. The general position in the Southern Diocese with the clergy was that they favoured gradual abolition. This was also true, true in the North. Uh, the one bishop who went into print in favour of slavery in the mid-19th century, funnily enough, was Bishop Hopkins of Vermont. Uh, similarly, the, one, the bishop who was most active in the cause of abolition was Meade of Virginia, though he preferred the gradualist approach of the American Colonization Society. And although you can find a few firebrands on the abolitionist side, particularly though amongst those who are at a safe distance from the southern states, um, you don't find much controversy over slavery. 
which was the issue that divided many other denominations in the United States, for example, the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Baptists. But rather what you get are a series of politically driven prosecutions. Henry Onderdonk of Pennsylvania was suspended for drunkenness. He took laudanum to relieve chronic back pain. Benjamin Onderdonk, the 19th century Episcopal Church equivalent of Joe the Hans Biden, uh, was deposed for um, immorality. George Washington Doan for being a lousy bookkeeper and so on. No evangelical bishop faced similar charges, which created the feeling that the high church school was being singled out for the treatment by the evangelicals. But the evangelicals had woken up to the fact that the Tractarian movement represented a very different theological direction to the one they felt the Protestant Episcopal Church should be heading in. The author of this evening's, uh, ser of the sermon I gave you to read, uh, George David Cummins, is now remembered primarily as the founder of the Reformed Episcopal Church. He was born in 1822. His background was a mixture of Episcopalian and Methodist. Uh, after his father died, his mother remarried a Methodist this time, and G.D. Cummins was brought up as a Methodist. He attended Dickinson College, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in 1843, and then went on the circuit as a Methodist preacher. In 1845, he returned to the church of his baptism and read for orders under the Evangelical Bishop of Delaware, Alfred Lee, and was ordained deacon in 1846 and presbyter earlier the next year. The Cummings family, with its mixed religious background, probably made the switch really easy for Cummings. But his main reason for taking shelter in the Episcopal Church was that it got him out of the strife over slavery within the Methodist Episcopal Church. And I suppose that his conversion to Episcopalianism was accompanied by emotions not dissimilar to those Scots who, tired of the strife between evangelical and moderate in the Kirk in the 19th century, decided that I'll just gang back to my granny's Kirk and returned to the Episcopal Church of Scotland. One thing that is very noticeable about Cummins in the 20 years of his ministerial life between 1846 and 1866 is that he managed to avoid getting sucked into the churchmanship conflicts within the Protestant Episcopal Church. He was a firm evangelical, and he certainly was never one of those to leave his thoughts on a serious subject unpublished. But he managed to coexist with, for example, William Whittingham, the uh, old high church Tractarian leaning Bishop of Maryland when he was rector of the Episcopal Parish in Georgetown. He was also the delegate at the General Convention of 1866, who moved the motion to readmit the Southern Dioceses that had formerly been part of the Protestant Episcopal Church of the Confederate States back into the General Convention after the war between the states. Thus he was perceived as a reconciler, uh, not just between North and South, but also between the High Church and the Evangelical factions within the Episcopal Church. And as a result of this, he was elected as the Assistant Bishop of the Diocese of Kentucky. Now, Kentucky, in some respects, was a very peculiar diocese. Um, the first bishop was Benjamin Bosworth Smith, who was a firm evangelical, who had been consecrated as far back as 1830, at which point he'd been 33 years of age. Bosworth Smith was not a particularly strong personality, and for much of his time as Bishop of Kentucky, he was dominated by the Standing Committee, which was run essentially by two New Yorkers, uh, Craik and Shipman, both of whom were high churchmen. So although the Diocese of Kentucky had a majority of evangelical clergy, it tended to be the high church clique that ran the diocese, and to a large extent Bishop Smith was a rubber stamp. 
Cummins' appointment coincided with the advent of the first ritual parish in Kentucky. And although Cummins was brought in as a reconciling influence, the stage was soon set for a confrontation. Cummins won the first round, but the High Church dominated standing committee made sure to uh, place pressure upon Smith, who was quite happily retired to his family's estate in New Jersey, to remain on paper the Bishop of the Diocese in order to prevent Cummins becoming the diocesan, because everybody knew that within five minutes of Cummins becoming Bishop of Kentucky, ritualism would be dead. So Smith continued in office, he was 70 at the time, uh, until his death at the age of almost 90 in 1887, whilst Cummins did all the work. This personal setback was accompanied by the Tractarians finally having enough political clout in the Episcopal Church to pay back the Evangelicals in their own coin for the events described earlier. But instead of going after the Evangelical bishops like Cummins, um, John Johns of Virginia, McIlvain of Ohio, they went after certain prominently placed rectors. Uh, they hauled up Stephen Higginson Ting's son Dudley. Sorry, no, it was, it was Stephen Ting the third who got hauled up for um, ritual offences in the Diocese of New York. And then Edward Cheney was hauled up for omitting the sentence, this child now being regenerate from the baptismal office in the Diocese of Chicago. He was rector of Christ Church there. And it was a new parish established in 1861 that had become very much the house that Cheney built. Unfortunately for him, he had Henry Whitehouse as his bishop, who, to put it nicely, was both a thoroughgoing Tractarian sympathizer and a lousy judge of character. Cheney was hauled up for omitting the phrase, this child now being regenerate from the baptismal office. And this was not an uncommon practice amongst evangelicals, many of whom have become uh, uncomfortable with the 1789 prayer books baptismal office as the Tractarians had laid more and more emphasis on the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. White House of course packed the court, Cheney was deposed and his parish promptly followed him out of the Episcopal Church and for the next four years he was in the wilderness although Cummins wrote to him stating that he would not be long lacking brethren. Cummins' own personal boiling point seems to have been reached in the early 1870s. He attended a meeting in New York City of 35 clergy in 1871 to discuss um, what they should do if the next general convention didn't do something to clamp down on ritualism. And the problem with ritualism wasn't so much the ritual as the doctrines that went with it. The 1871 General Convention was a fraught affair. It was kind of a pyrrhic victory for the evangelicals. They got some of what they wanted out of the House of Bishops who passed a motion depreciating um, innovations in ceremonial. But they didn't get the canonical changes that they wanted to give that measure some clout. Cummins went back to Kentucky and continued his lonely fight against ritualism by the banks of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. But he continued networking with other evangelical clergy. Cummins' own boiling point was reached following a meeting of the Interdenominational Evangelical Association in New York City when he was attacked by the Right, right Reverend William George Tozer, the former U university's mission of Central Africa, um, Bishop of Zanzibar, who was in New York recovering from a breakdown in his health. Tozer seems to have been a particularly angular personality. Uh, born in Tynmouth in Devon in 1827, uh, he was ordained in the Diocese of Lincoln in 
1849 as cure of to Burley Marsh near Skegness. From there, he circulated around a number of moderately wealthy livings before he was chosen by UMCA to go out as the first bishop of Zanzibar. And he was an absolutely uncompromising Tractarian. Later on in life, he spent a brief period as rector of South Ferriby, uh, which is the family, uh, village my family's from. And then he was sent briefly to, as Bishop of Jamaica until his health broke down again. And he spent the rest of his life uh, in retirement in Devon. There's only really two points at which Tozer really gets into the historical record. First of all, as the first Bishop of Zanzibar, and also for his part in the Cummins uh, debacle. And it's thought that he was used as a stalking horse by uh, he Henry Potter, the Bishop of New York, to launch an attack on the evangelical Cummins, who got into trouble for participating by administering the cup in an interdenominational communion service held at Second Presbyterian Church, New York City, in connection with the Evangelical Association meeting. And as other Tractarians piled on, this pushed Cummins over the edge. He resigned as Assistant Bishop of Kentucky and called a meeting in the YMCA building in New York City for the 2nd of December, 1873. This organized the Reformed Episcopal Church confirmed Cheney's election as missionary bishop to the Northwest, and Cummins consecrated him solo on the 14th of December, 1873. And the sermon that I made you all drag through uh, was the sermon that was preached at that con con consecration. And it's a bit of a doozy. Uh, it must have lasted well over an hour when it was first preached although the version you had, which was the tract version printed in New York in 1874, um, contains quite a bit of extra material when compared to the original sermon. Uh, certainly, it must have been a bit of a strain on the congregation in the overcrowded church in Chicago on that December afternoon, but it articulates the low view of episcopacy very nicely. And there are four premises premises in a uh, common sermon which I think we need to take a look at. Firstly, that in the apostolic church there were two orders of ministers, presbyters and deacons. Secondly, that the episcopate has no direct institution from our Lord. Thirdly, that it arose by delegation from the House of Presbyters, the presbyters electing a president over themselves. Fourthly, that the rise of monarchical episcopacy represents a corruption of the original institution. The fact that the sermon was so quickly published suggests to me that Cummins felt a need to get a defense of his position into print as quickly as he could. Unfortunately, whilst accurately representing the sort of low views of episcopacy common amongst latitudinarians and evangelicals. It's a position on episcopacy which historically speaking and theologically speaking has some problems. And I think the first thing that we have to look at is, of course, if you're going to begin, begin at the beginning, which is the first proposition that the apostolic church had two orders of ministry. Whilst Cummins provides a lengthy list of authorities supporting his view, he does not give adequate space to the New Testament passages on this subject. Uh, he takes as his text uh, 1 Peter 4, 1 to, sorry, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, and he draws a false inference from that, uh, which is the parity of elders and overseers. And this really gets him up the creek right from the get-go. He prefers to appeal as the basis of episcopacy to the example of James as the president of the Council of the Apostles, uh, as you can see in the Acts. And then he rather skates over 1 Timothy, 
which speaks of bishops and deacons in chapter 2 and then speaks of elders in chapter 5, which would seem to infer at the very least there are three different ministries, if not three different actual orders. It would be, indeed be a legitimate inference from 1 Timothy that there are three separate orders of minister. But then, of course, he doesn't pay any attention to the epistle to Titus. And this is where he really runs himself into some difficulty because Titus chapter 1 definitely portrays an episcopal and a presbyterial office that are separate. Now, I'm being a little bit careful about my terminology here because um, if we start asserting things like there were two orders or there were three orders of minister in the early church, we're taking a slightly later terminology and projecting it backwards. Um, it's probably a lot more valid to say three offices. And how the three interacted with each other in precise terms is a little bit difficult to infer from scripture. However, there's enough evidence there to infer that there were, as Grandma writes in the preface to the ordinal, these three orders of minister in the church, bishop, presbyter, and deacon. The difficulty that Cummins runs himself into by using 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4 as the text of his sermon is that he cannot, working forward from that particular text, take adequate account of what St. Paul says, which definitely infers three orders of ministry. The second proposition that Cummins makes, that the Episcopate has no direct sanction from Christ, depends a lot on what you believe the nature of the office of an apostle to be. Now, Cummins sets his stall out by saying that the office was unique and that no aspect of it was transferable. Well, there he has made a pretty serious mistake because one of the gifts that was given to the apostles, the binding and loosing of sin, the power of the keys, has traditionally, even by the most Protestant of Protestants uh, who came out of the Magisterial Reformation, been regarded as something that belongs to the, to the ordained ministry. So if the power to absolve can be passed down, why not other powers? So it would seem to be a false inference to reject out of hand the notion that there was not some sort of transfer of apostolic authority from the apostle to the out Oh, died out, martyred out, uh, between 46 and around 100 AD. If absolution could be passed along, why not other aspects of the apostolic ministry, such as the guardianship of the faith once delivered to the saints? The third proposition that Cummins makes, that the episcopate arose by delegation from the, from the presbyterate, is again something of a... I won't call it a false enter inference, but it's a, it's a stretch. For example, Titus 1.5 states, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And the simplest reading of this text is to assume that Titus was commissioned as some sort of missionary bishop to organize the church in Crete. And if you read a few verses later, when he discusses the qualifications of a bishop, it's obvious that Paul is speaking of two separate issues, two separate orders. The fourth proposition that Cummins gets himself into hot water is that monarchical episcopacy is a corruption of the original institution. We simply don't have enough evidence to make that assertion. Um, certainly so far as the early church was concerned, 
and in fact well into the Middle Ages, bishops were advised by a council of presbyters. Uh, originally that was the whole presbyterate of the diocese. Uh, later on it was to become the cathedral chapter. Uh, still later than that, it tended to be the bishop's kitchen cabinet, uh, as the medieval institutions of the church tended to go their separate ways. But Cummings regards monarchical uh, episcopacy as being a corruption, I think, because he's reading back an American Republican understanding of politics into the early church. And I don't think that's you know in any way, shape, or form. Um, theologically or historically valid. The model of government with which the early church was most familiar was monarchy. Now, the sort of monarchy that they are talking about is not the absolute monarchy of the 17th century. Monarchy by its very nature, for much of history, has been limited and very often contractual. Remember the kings of Israel, how they were anointed and brought into a particular relationship with God through the covenant uh, in order to be his ministers for the good of the nation. In the same way, bishops were separated for their ministry in the church by the laying on of hands with prayer, which implies some sort of contractual stroke covenant relationship with the church that they operated in a specific role under specific restrictions. Whereas Cummins, what Cummins is really trying to con combat is a medieval idea of what monarchical episcopacy is. And this derives from the model of the papacy, which develops in the early Middle Ages. And one of the things that you have to deal with, with someone like Cummins who is extremely fond of quoting the reformers when discussing episcopacy is that behind the reformers stands the somewhat dubious heritage of the medieval church and if you look at the way in which the medieval church treated holy orders you have two very different schools of thought you have the traditional three order people uh, bishop priest deacon then you have those who take the attitude that priest, deacon, and subdeacon are the three major orders of ministry. Then you have those who talk about the Pope and the priest being the two essential ministers of the church. And out of that late medieval thinkers like Martin Luther drew the inference that bishop and priest were essentially one order differentiated by function. In other words, whilst in theory presbyters had the power to ordain, it was only exercised by bishops because they were consecrated to exercise the extra functions that were inherent in their ministry. It's a really dodgy piece of reasoning. But, um, you know, in... 1530s Germany with an uncooperative set of bishops, what else do you do? Um, and unfortunately, this rejection of the threefold ministry becomes a sort of touchstone of being a proper Protestant. And where Cummins is coming from is a low church, latitudinarian view of episcopacy that was informed very largely by the desire to minimize the differences between Episcopalians and other Protestants. And as a result of this, he isn't at, at all adverse to running rings around uh, the history of the, the early church. Uh, his tendency isn't so much to invent things, as to pass over those things that would contradict his notions. You'll notice he rejects um, the witness of Ignatius of Antioch with the words, uh, some people assert on the basis of forged epistles by St. Ignatius that, you know, he's being extremely naughty uh, in what he's doing in that he's ignoring 
the contrary testimony to his view of episcopacy. The reason why I brought Cummins into the discussion was he represents one historical view of episcopacy within the Anglican tradition. And it's the view that is associated with historically the low church movement, the moderate Puritans, uh, the Latitudinarians in the 18th century, the evangelicals in the early 19th century. Um, and it was a view of episcopacy that was designed to make it less intimidating to outsiders. Um, it's almost the Protestant ecumenical impulse at work. And I think what it tends to do is take one side of the patristic witness about the development of episcopacy in the early church and turn it into the whole thing. Yes, we know about exceptions like Rome and Alexandria, where episcopacy arose by delegation from the presbyterate. But he's inclined to ignore the contrary testimony of churches like Ephesus and Smyrna, where the bishop was consecrated by other bishops and it was treated as a fully separate order from an early date. The other problem, I think, with Cummins' sermon lies in the fact that we have to concede that over the intervening 170, uh, 146 years, um, the scholarship concerning the development of the Episcopate has moved on a lot. I mean, the most recent authority, um, Cummins quotes, is Lightfoot. And Lightfoot was one of those who was a staunch proponent of the two-order view of episcopacy, with episcopacy arising out of the presbyterate for the good order of the church. Uh, Gore, by the way, uses exactly the same all, uh, argument, but says the presbyterate arose uh, out of the episcopate by delegation. It's like, okay, guys, tweedledee, tweedledum, let's get over it. Um, what, what I think we have to be very forceful in saying about the views of people like Cummins is a lot of water has gone over the, under the bridge or over the dam uh, in the century and a half since Cummins wrote this sermon. Certainly our understanding of the origins of the Christian church are much clearer and even certain um, witnesses who would ordinarily be hostile to episcopacy more or less concede that the early church had three orders of ministers. Uh, they may dance all around the fire to try and avoid saying that but you know they concede in their exegesis of passages such as Tim, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 5 and Titus chapter 1 uh, that there were three orders of minister in the early church. So what I think we need to look at next week is, I'm not going to say a text from the other side, I think we need to look in detail at one of the gentlemen that um, Cummins invokes at the beginning of his sermon. And I think the document that we need to look at is William White's um, Case of the Protestant Episcopalians in America Considered, 1782. I'll have a dig around, see if I can find it on the internet. If not, I'll have to find it online, praise it, and, and go over it with you next week. The reason for this is that Cummins claims his low view of episcopacy is based on what the Episcopal Church originally intended. And I think the mistake that Cummins is making there is he is confusing a low view of episcopacy, which basically sees it as being no different from the ministry of a presbyter, with the sort of limited, i.e. constitutional, episcopacy, which White writes about in his pamphlet of 1782. A lot of White's ideas seem to come from another authority 
that Cummins is fond of quoting, and that is Archbishop James Usher. Uh, Usher's work on episcopacy was written in 1642 uh, during the English Civil War. And what Usher was trying to do was to find some common ground between Episcopalians and Presbyterians to prevent the Puritans from totally destroying the idea of a national church. As you'll recollect, in the 1640s, you go through a period where the English bishops are deprived, the Book of Common Prayer is banned, the Westminster uh, conference is called, it produces the Westminster Confession of Faith, the, uh, the Westminster Catechism and the Westminster Directory, uh, all of which to some degree are aimed against Anglicanism. Attempts to establish a Presbyterian National Church fail in 1645 because the Congregationalists won't cooperate with the Presbyterians. And that sets the stage for 15 years of chaos, which ends with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. And with the restoration of the monarchy, the restoration not only of episcopacy, but also of the high view of episcopacy that had been characteristic of the Laudians. And I use the term Laudian as a pure convenience. Uh, in fact, the foremost scholar of the origins of episcopacy under um, James I and Charles I was Joseph Hall, um, who briefly was a delegate for the British uh, of King James at the Synod of Dort. Um, so, you know, no Arminian he. Uh, and he traced back the threefold ministry into apostolic times. And I still think Hall's is the best um, work on episcopacy that's been produced uh, by an early Anglican because of his insistence, you know, on tracing the threefold ministry back through the early fathers and councils, through the sub-apostolic fathers to the text of scripture. The difficulty, of course, is that by the mid 19th century, when you have two deeply polarized parties within the Episcopal Church, each side is gonna choose its favorite authors, authors and basically ride their writings to death uh, in the pursuit of polemic. So having seen one side of the argument, Next week we'll have a look at the middle, and then the week after that I'll see if I can find something from a Laudian point of view uh, that gives you the moderate high church, i.e. the authentic high church view of episcopacy, you know, before we get into the extravagances of the 19th century. I think I've just nicely filled out my 40 minutes of that. Okay, any questions? Well, did you, um, you know, we, we know the, the Bible only mentions deacons and bishops. No, it doesn't. Oh, okay. It mentions deacons, it, elders, and overseers. And overseers. I thought uh, it said deacons in one of the th things. I was uh, just looking, I was reading your following along at Timothy. But... Episcopos. Yeah. If you take uh, 1 Timothy, 2, you have bishops and deacons. In 1 Timothy 5, he talks about elders. Then in Titus chapter 1, he talks first about elders. Titus is to set apart elders in every city. And then a few verses later, he goes on and says, and the bishop must be, describing the qualifications of a bishop. And I think the legitimate inference from that is that when St. Paul is talking about presbyters and bishops, overseers and elders, he's talking about two different offices. It's, it's, yeah. it's First Timothy 3. You're 3, here. sorry. That's okay. I can't read my own handwriting. That's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, one of, what, it seems to be one of my rules to live by is thou shalt not proofread. 
And, you know, th th this is something, one of my little comments about the whole debate about two orders or three, is that when you are dealing with ancient texts, when you're dealing with ancient institutions, that which is most commonplace, that which is most accepted, very often is not discussed in detail. Because everybody knew what they were talking about. And if you look at the models to which the early church would have looked for guidance in terms of how to set up a ministry, they would have naturally looked at the synagogue. And as we know from the Gospels, you know, synagogues had presidents. They also had elders. And it isn't too much of a stretch just to see the apostles taking that form of organization over, bringing it into the early church, adding deacons, bingo, you've got your three offices of ministry. And the way in which they set people apart to a ministry in the early church, the laying on of hands with prayer, which to us is the form of ordination. Then you also have a second line of development in terms of how the early fathers understood the ministry of the church that is taken over from the temple. And I think this comes in a little bit later after the fall of the temple in 70 AD and a growing awareness in certain, uh, you know, at this stage as um, the synagogue and the church are beginning to drift apart. That, you know, Christ is the true temple. That's the whole basis of the epistle to the Hebrews. You know, the typology of the temple is used to explain the ministry of Christ. And therefore, it's not too much of a stretch to say that the bishops, priests, and deacons of the church are the equivalents of the high priest, priests, and Levites of the temple under the new covenant. Uh, funnily enough, you see the same sort of exegesis again in the 19th century with uh, Irvin and the Catholic and Apostolic Church, except he does it for one generation and says, you know, because Irving was a little bit of an eccentric, theologically speaking. Uh, you know, he, he appoints apostles, bishops, presbyters, and, and deacons in the Catholic and Apostolic Church, says no more are to be ordained after the death of the last apostle. I think the last deacon kicked the bucket in the 1980s. Um, but, you know, he used the typology of the temple to justify reintroducing the threefold ministry into what had previously been um, a Presbyterian church, um, the old um, Gordon Square Presbyterian Church in London, uh, which became the first Catholic and Apostolic Church. So that typology, you know, is there, not just in the 19th century, but in the second century, and possibly very late in the first. Um, you also have the example of Ignatius of Antioch. And although Ignatius of Antioch has a very high view of episcopacy, firstly, there is no evidence to suggest that he ever ruled without the advice and consent of his presbyters. But he is insisting upon the bishop as the focus of unity and the main sacramental minister of the church. Um, and this is really what separates the low view from the high view. The low view is that the presbyter is the main sacramental minister of the church and also the focus of unity. And that argument breaks down right there because in the early church, who is the usual president at the Eucharist? The bishop. And that tells me, you know, the Presbyterian argument, and by extension, Cummins' low view of episcopacy, has a wobbly wheel right there. And if you look at the organization of early basilicas, um, the form of a basilica, just to recap, is taken from the law courts of the Roman Empire. What they introduce that is new is the altar under the canopy 
that in front of the horseshoe of seats at the at the far end of the basilica. In the centre originally was the throne for the judge. The throne for the judge becomes the throne for the bishop. And around him on the top bench arranged the presbyters, on the lower bench arranged the deacons. And it is a higher hierarchic form of worship right from the beginning, with each order in the hierarchy from laity through deacons through presbyters to the bishop himself taking the proper part in the ministry and if you look in the service and if you look for example at the revelation of saint john you have the hierarchy in worship there as well so the leveling impulse that you get in low episcopal and presbyterian apologetics about the ministry it sits a little uneasily with the new testament anything else while i'm getting into trouble no you're doing very fine i was just, just thinking that in revelation isn't it interesting how he writes to one messenger in each city yes and I, I think it's a legitimate inference from that that he's writing to the to the bishop, the overseer. Because the, the thing that always sticks in my mind when I see the word overseer uh, used in connection with bishops is a little cartoon that was in a book that was brought out about the same time as the Revised Liturgy in England. And it makes the point that the word episcopus was used for all sorts of superintendents and overseers in the Roman Empire, including in one city, the guy who checked the drains. And so there's a little drawing there of a bishop in Cope and Mitre poking his uh, crozier somewhat speculatively down a drain to, to, to sort of illustrate, you know, overseer means the one, you know, bishop is the one having oversight. Um, you know, it's, you know, that that's the the core function next to being the principal sacramental minister of the church of course the thing that an enormously didn't help people like commons is their views of episcopacy were very much formed in an era where both sides were you know just making the most ridiculous claims um you know I, I mean the tendency of newman when he was an anglican was anglican was to turn every bishop into the pope which you know when uh, a newman being newman when he's pope i.e the bishop of oxford disagreed with him he took it very badly indeed and you can see the decline of Newman's adherence to Anglicanism as starting in, you know, 1841, when Bishop Baggett basically turned around and said, no to Track 90. And after that, you know, Newman rapidly, you know. But of course, the Newman brothers were all a bit peculiar. Um, one brother became an out, a Unitarian, uh, another was an outright skeptic, and the third became a Roman Catholic Uh I think with all three of them, they were looking for authority in religion. You know, I still can't get uh, Faber's Oxford Apostles out of my mind, where you know he he said you know Newman's primary drive was for authority in religion. So he started off believing in an infallible Bible. Then in his high church phase, he believed in an infallible church. And then when he couldn't find that in the Church of England, he decided that it was the Church of Rome. But, you know, Newman is, you know, the search for authority is very strong there. And of course, the thing with Newman is, 
Newman's writings throughout the 19th century have enormous influence with those um, influenced by the Tractarian movement. And, you know, I have to be honest about the Tractarians. I don't, you know, simply condemn them under a blanket. Um, you know, they're not all equally bad. Um, Pusey, certainly, some of his writing is extremely interesting. Um, but it's, it's not in the Tracts. It's, you know, when he's taught, it's the uh, Eucologian um, and various other writings of his where he's trying to see his way past impasses such as the filio quae clause uh, coming to some sort of understanding of the real presence that gives you know proper weight to each of the aspects as it's seen in scripture uh, similarly Pusey is the man who warns the British intellectual environment of the dangers of um, German high criticism of the Bible. So, you know, he, study, he studies in Berlin 1828, 1829, and comes back to Oxford and basically is saying, you need to know what's coming your way from Germany. Um, then, you know, Thomas Keeble, John's brother, is very conservative. He really doesn't write anything that you wouldn't have found in the Caroline Divines. Uh, John Keeble himself is always, always, you know, he's he would have saved himself a lot of trouble by saying outright what he thought of some of Newman's opinions. But, you know, he was very loyal to Newman, who had been a close friend for years. He tended to give some of Newman's more extreme opinions a free pass. Uh, thus causing a lot of tr trouble for himself. Then you've got Isaac Williams, who was relatively conservative. And you, know, you, you can almost sense with the Tractarians there is a, they're getting pulled in two directions. They know perfectly well what the old theology of the high church movement was, the theology of the, of the Caroline Divines, uh, and then of people like Johnson of Cranbrook, um, Bishop Horn, the later non jurors they know what that theology is. And yet, because of Romanticism, uh, because of the influence of people like Hurrell Frude and Newman, they go beyond that and they get themselves into hot water. And really into positions which um, are essentially false for Anglicans. So, you know, I, I find it extremely difficult to do the blanket condemnation job uh, that so many people on the reform stroke evangelical side of the church do when it co comes to the Tractarians. You know, you know, they have to be read with discrimination, but not everything that they wrote is a problem. Actually, it might be worth, just for the heck of it, looking at track number one when we want the high view of Episcopacy. I need to reread it though before I set that. Okay, anything else? Gosh, we're all quiet tonight. I'm gonna be off of here before eight o'clock at this rate. Oh, you did such a good job, it's, it's all wrapped up. Okay, well, just, to finish the story with Cummins, by the way, um, Cummins, although he founded the REC, didn't live long enough to be a really effective, um, pardon the expression, godfather. Um, he died in 1876. And the next 20 years of the history of the Reformed Episcopal Church is a soap opera. Uh, because everyone with an idea and a drum to beat came out of the woodwork after Cummins' death and, you know, they started revising the prayer book. There was a long controversy over whether they should still use the surplus. Um, you know, just to give you an idea of how bad it was, the, uh, the phrase, he descended into hell, 
went back into the Apostles' Creed in 1876 when they were discussing the 1786 prayer book. It came out again in 1877. It went back in again in 1878. And, you know, this is why, if you look at the early history of the Reformed Episcopal Church, they grow very strongly for a few years after 1873. And then around 1880, they stalled because folks in the Episcopal Church who might finally have had enough of the strife in the Episcopal Church and joined the REC were put off because of the strife within the REC. And so, you know, just as the meeting in the YMCA in New York is the beginning of the growth period for the REC, in the same way you can see the completion of the original Reformed Episcopal Seminary in Philadelphia and Christ Memorial Church that went with it, and the 1889 General Council that immediately followed it as being kind of the end of the growth period for the REC. And then they enter a long period of decline that continues through the 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, they start holding their own. And this continues through into the 1980s when they finally begin to go, grow again by beginning to undo the mistakes they made in the 1880s, such as supplanting the 39 articles with the 35 articles. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of to complete the Cummins story. Okay, any more for any more? I shall go on and have a look and see if Bishop White's, um, the case of the Protestant Episcopalians in America is considered is online. If it is, I will have it sent out to you all and we will discuss it next week, okay? Right, thank you very much.